welcome to Talking Apple. We're a podcast from Grand Prix Grandstand that does more or less what that title says. We talk about Apple. More specifically, we talk about Formula All. That means Formula One, Formula Two, Formula Three, and the W Series. And for the very first time since the podcast began, we can actually talk about the W Series after it put on a terrific show in its first race supporting the Grand Prix weekend. We're going to digest all of that in depth plus a little known sport called Formula One. So get ready to listen to us talking about Alice Powell enjoying the back-to-back wins about 700 days apart, Sarah Moore making history, a tale of two Garcias, the best export from Liechtenstein making her second podium, contact from the expected championship protagonist Kimberline and Chadwick and Visser, and Red Bull making it to four wins in a row as Max Verstappen leads from lights to flag. And who better to talk about a Flying Dutchman and feeder series racing than a Dutch guru behind F1 feeder series, Floris Visman. Welcome back. How are you? Thank you. I'm uh, fine. How are you? Yes, I'm doing very well. It's great to see you back. Of course, you were joining us very early in the podcast as well. So I'm sure you've seen, what, about a third of the Formula One season now? How's it going from your end? (laughs) <laughs> it's going as planned because uh, we have a Dutchman uh, leading finally, so uh, that's all that matters. That's <laughs> all that matters. Listen to that. <laughs> and well, I guess I need to even it out by a couple of Brits. We've got, as ever, I can't talk F all without them. I've got T. Albers Daly and Jacob Phillips. Welcome back, guys. How are you? I'm doing really well, thanks, Jim. How are you doing this morning? Yeah, pretty, pretty damn good. And Timo, how's things going on your end with the Styrian Grand Prix? Well, I've woken up finally, so I didn't miss too much when I dozed off, so it's all good on my end as well, thanks. Yes, we're going to talk all about the F1 element of the Syrian Grand Prix, but it's been so long since the last W Series race, why should we wait any longer to talk about it? Floris, it's been, like I said, 700 odd days. Did W Series deliver? They did and they didn't um, uh, because uh, I think, you know, like you said, they put on a great show. Uh, it, was, it was entertaining as hell. We had a great winner with, uh, with Powell, uh, more making history, like you said, uh, and a couple of uh, rookies that did very well. But I also think, like in general, there's not enough track time, for instance. Mm-hmm. So a lot of these drivers are, are pretty rusty uh, because uh, some of them didn't even drive uh, the whole of 2020. Uh, and then you have a 30 minute practice uh, and then you go straight into qualifying for 30 minutes and you have a 30 minute race. So uh, in FIDA series in general, it's really important to get as much track time as you can. And I think that's a, that's a little, it's going to be a problem. That's a good point. Uh, it would be quite useful, I suppose. Uh, I know they had the Anglesey test, which was great, but very different sort of circuit from, from Styria, from the Red Bull ring. But it might be beneficial that you're getting two races there to get rid of some of that rust. Uh, Timo, do you echo those statements? It's been a long time since the drivers were racing competitively. Do you think that's why we saw so many bits of contact throughout the race? Yeah, I mean, I, I, can, I can see where Florida come coming from for sure. I think maybe... The bit that I had the most problem with was perhaps the qualifying. I thought maybe a way to fix that, have two 15-minute sessions instead of a 30 minutes, because it just, it was it was all right. It was entertaining, but it was kind of, I think I'm just so used to F1 qualifying that it just, when it's not an hour long, I'm like, eh, it's all right. <laughs> but I feel like maybe if you had a way to spice up like t- 10, two lots of 10 maybe, so that they don't all race at the same time. And then you take the top and then you sort it out time-wise from there and just be an interesting way to spice it up a bit. Yeah, it's funny, actually. I, I watched the qualifying, I watched the entire session. Uh, I actually watched 25 minutes of the session because I couldn't find out where the hell it was uh, being broadcast for the first five minutes, uh, but figured that out eventually. Um, and thanks to F-Series for letting us know that in Twitter. So I'll uh, get a little shout out to you there. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought... After watching, you've got a good point. After watching F1 quality for so long, it's one of those weird ones. It's just, it felt like a very long practice session with the times kind of tumbling. And these tyres are very different from the other tyres we see in formula racing, these Hankook tyres. that They just didn't seem to lose the edge at all. They've very, got a lot of uh, durability in them. So, so they take ages to warm up. And then mm-hmm. if you're going back in the pits, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot slightly. So Yeah, there's no uh, mad dash to do one quick lap afterwards. But... It gave us a kind of grid, especially with Chadwick being a bit further down than we expected. And Jacob, I know W Series is 
all new to you or mostly new to you this year and your first experience watching a race live how did it go oh, i said to you boys on saturday that i thought it was quite entertaining it's my first actual um, w series race that i've watched i spent the off season watching the highlights from 2019 and um catch up that brand new documentary that we've talked about as well and, yeah it was entertaining i do actually echo the points of the, uh, the two other guys there i think i think very much so the qualifying wasn't that entertaining i do find that maybe we did f2 and f3 i'm never always the biggest fan of feeder series qualifying but the race was good you know, I do echo uh, Flores' points as well. You know, we do need, uh, I think, more than half an hour on a Grand Prix weekend and time and scheduling are tight, but we do see F3, F2 races and they have four to five minutes. And we used to have, you know, F3 and F2 on the weekend. So, yeah, the action was good, but, you know, very dominant win there for Alice Powell. Yeah, Alice Powell was absolutely on fire. I think, was it topping every session, fastest lap, lights to flag, just absolutely in a league of her own. And I worry, maybe we saw Chadwick didn't leave uh, didn't leave the championship lead last time round, and I wonder if that could be something we'll see this time with Powell. Uh, Floris, do you think it's potentially going to be a Powell season of leading the championship the entire year? Yeah, maybe. Uh, I think she's, she's a genuine contender. I don't think it's like a one-off, um, and she also has the the luck. Um, that Chadwick didn't get many points and that Fizzer, of course, uh, left with zero points, which was very, uh, very unlucky, of course, because she got hit. But still, uh, she has 25 points. It's only uh, eight round season. So, uh, yeah, I think she has to be a one of the favorites. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think you're, you've watched a lot more feeder series than, than we have? And we've got, of course, this year, three races per round in Formula 3 and Formula 2. And after me and the guys have spoken F all about this, uh, you know, on numerous occasions, got to the point, I think, in France, we're calling some of the wrong incidents in the wrong races because there's just so much racing. It's great. W Series almost felt like it was here and then gone. You know, we're just Saturday afternoon. It's just done, finished, nothing more to, to see. And I'm glad that there's a, another round so quick. Do you think they maybe could have changed the setup with maybe two races per round instead, that could have been beneficial? Yeah, that, that could be a very good solution. Uh, I don't know if it's possible this year. Uh, and also, uh, I have a bit of a problem with uh, timed races. Uh, because, when, you know, when you get a safety car or something, uh, just, just uh, the, 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 the time goes on. So you lose like five or 10 minutes of a 30-minute race. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's also a problem. So I would definitely get rid of uh, timed races, which is, I don't know if it's that easy because you have a schedule like, for instance, next weekend, uh, you have uh, W Series F3 and F1. Uh, so, so I don't know how long you can go on if you have, like, a, a long safety car or red flag or whatever. But, yeah, that, that's one of the solutions. Just get rid of those timed races. Yeah, very frustrating uh, seeing the safety car come out. I was quite concerned it was going to finish under the safety car. They're uh, not quite as quick as the marshals at Monaco. They weren't terrible by any stretch of the imagination but no one wants to see a race finish under the safety car but it was a mad dash to the finish it wasn't quite Baku levels of Formula One sprint racing at the end and Jacob that gave us a quite a bit of spice in the end with uh, several incidents causing drama throughout Koyama streaked through Volvend went from P9 to P3 Chadwick coming back after getting tagged early on by Hawkins what did you make of the post-race safety car period no yeah, it was certainly entertaining it certainly made us think that you know alice powell had dominated the whole weekend and we thought you know maybe there was a chance for certainly more to catch her but you know she she led from the front there well but you know there's so many incidents towards the back there and we thought that you know it probably is because like the guys have said there previously that because we've had so long without racing and they haven't had the track time that you know the incidents happened you know it's very very unlucky for, for loads of drivers there we saw um can't quite remember who, who on the final two laps who had the uh, contact was it hawkins took out Hawkins took out Chadwick early doors uh, and then uh, Chadwick was able to fight back. But Kimmer Leinen and Visser, the championship contenders, deciding to make it a lot easier for Powell with, well, from Kimmer Leinen's point of view, she said that she took just a different racing line. Uh, it wasn't exactly the same incident. And maybe actually one thing just to want to bring up the coverage, I could really do with some onboards. And I don't know if you, all of you guys have seen the WC's Driven documentary. There were some new onboards from that that we didn't see originally. And I don't know if it's just not possible with the technology in the cars, but I felt like I missed out quite a bit on the incidents. 
but yeah, it was uh, just to answer, answer your question, Jacob. It was Kimberline taking out Vissa and with it a lot of championship points and then causing quite a dangerous situation with the front wing almost trying to fall off. Yeah, it was very, very dangerous. And, but, you know, once again, we see that safety cars can bring safety cars in further instances. So, you know, we might see that going on into further rounds as well. But, yeah, it's certainly good for Powell anyway that two of their championship rivals got taken out. And, you know, they've got a lot to build on for next week. Yeah, they look strong, though. Uh, Timo, I know you've seen W Series before. And we'd say that Kimmelainen and Powell, Volvend, Vissa and Chadwick obviously are the contenders coming in based off 2019. Would you still say that's accurate as we go into 2021? I'd say it's still accurate, but that could easily change after next weekend, depending on how things go. Because I think the driver of, the, of that group that needs to have a good weekend more than anyone else is Kim Alainen, just because of those missed races, through no fault of her own, mind you, in 2019. But if she was able to come back in such a strong way in the back half of that season that she could really do with not repeating that again this time around, just start strong. And so getting points next time out would be crucial. But I kind of, at the same time, don't want it to be the, the same people because the rookies, the, all six of them, at least three of them, I think all finished well inside the points, decent, or had decent results. And I just, I love the way that that spice things up because then it kind of really puts the cat among the pigeons a bit. And just because you were done in 2019 doesn't mean you're going to be doing well this time around which is perfect for, from a fan perspective. Yeah, uh, I was actually, we talked about, you know, the uh, patriotism early on, um, and maybe Vissa, you'll have different opinions of this florist, but as a Brit, but I've maybe we've got a lot of British drivers, but I was quite happy seeing Chadwick a bit further down the order. I know she had an issue in qualifying, which made mm. her struggle in qualifying and did admirably to, to qualify. I think it's P8 when she actually started the race. And I was just, yeah, I was just quite happy that it might not be the Jamie Chadwick show this year, that she just looked pretty untouchable for most of the season last year. And she was lucky to not be in a lot of incidents. And that might be from the fortune of qualifying high. So you're out of all the mess, like we've seen Kimmeline and Avissa this time around. But would you prefer to see a, a non Chadwick? championship this time around yeah yeah also because it's uh, not normal for uh, like a for a champion to return to a feeder series uh, of course it was, there were different reasons for that but uh, normally i'd say if you if you become a champion just move on to the next series so that is a reason uh, and yeah i don't know also also because um, i actually i hope that the champion whoever will be champion will be uh, like a younger driver because the average age uh, in W Series is really high for a feeder series. Like, I, I think maybe half the grid is over 25 or 26. Uh, and they're, I think they're almost, no, they're, they're two, just two teenagers, uh, Marty and, and another, uh, and uh, Cedar Koba, I think. Yeah, so yeah, I hope the, like, like the young, the really young drivers, they come up and uh, maybe take over, yeah. Yeah, we're good to see. Uh, it's an interesting point. Of course, feeder series racing, Jacob, is younger drivers. And do we think that W Series is kind of meant to be inspiring drivers that are younger to come into the series rather than actually be in the feeder series ladder? Because at the moment, I don't really know where it sits in terms of F3, European F3, F2. It seems to be maybe at the Formula Regional level, but because it's segregated, it's really hard to place. Yeah, it's certainly going to be, normally we see the, the feeder series bit, you know, F2 and F3, I think poor chair, 17, and we're so used to young drivers coming even onto the F1 grid now, where compared, like you say, to W Series, I think Powell's, come me, correct me if I'm wrong here, but 26 or 27, and it's certainly a bigger age spread throughout the field, but it's not just inspiring um, youngsters, it's also about inspiring women as well, and we need um, to give track time to these females who potentially can't get another series. Yeah, it's 28 for Powell, she's 28 years old, but it, I feel fortunate in some regards that she's got the opportunity to shine, because I, as we've all said before, we get frustrated that you have these young drivers who just can't make it through the ranks for reasons outside of their control, so W Series comes in and fixes that uh, but yeah Flores I think I echo your sentiments that we don't want to be a last chance saloon either if we're going to have a female racer in Formula One I believe the best way to do that is have young drivers proving themselves have a young Sidakova you know she's just turned uh, was it 19 yesterday 18 uh, yesterday 18 
18 yesterday as we're filming this on Monday. So yeah, she just turned 18. She can finally get a driver's license in Russia, which is hilarious. I love these sorts of stories. But I saw Paul Cher as well, just briefly talking mm. about Air 4, that he's finally finished school after winning Monaco. Oh. It's, it's comical. Um, but yeah, I think I'd like to see some younger drivers maybe take the championship and then progress further. Uh, Tibo, do you have some words on that? Yeah, I think it's it's one of the things where obviously it's the whole thing with W Series. It's meant to be there to provide and create opportunities and show that women are obviously able to do this kind of thing. Um, so obviously at the beginning, you're going to have a bit of a shortage of, of women because there's just not been any before really to have the opportunity to have this experience under their belt. So I think for obviously this year and probably next year and mm, putting the 50-50 on the year after, it'll be the same kind of people reoccurring but I think with the likes of Sidokova and uh, Marty there it's a good way to show that there's already uh, a younger generation coming through to, to do that and I think the more the, at least with the with the drivers there like Piri and Powell and everyone who's a bit older it's good to have them there because then it's it's role model to show that they get to sh- they get to show off their talent and then maybe they go off into a different form of motorsport because I mean there's there's plenty of them and I think I think with single seater in Formula One in particular age is such a crucial thing that mm. in terms of getting into it, once you're in, it's potentially a little bit easier to stay around. To look at like Kimi and Lewis and Fernando, they're all mm. a lot older than drivers we're used to in feeder series and people beginning to get an F1. So I think after that then they can they can go off and go and try something else a bit, but they get to prove themselves here a bit and show that they always have what it took and they show and they serve as good role models for those coming through. So I think just for now, it'll stay like that, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing and we get to then enjoy the best of both worlds. Yeah, it's great actually, um, because of the way that W Series is formatted. You probably can see this, if, especially if you watch the Driven documentary, but we see in the paddock and on social media, just how much of a community they seem to have between them. Mm-hmm. Like it was Sidakova's birthday and all the drivers were there to wish her happy birthday and brought out a cake. And if it's a racing driver's birthday, on a Grand Prix weekend, you'll see the team come out. It's all very segregated. So it's, it's nice to see that. And Alice Powell, of course, has been um, training a lot of drivers, a lot of coaching. She's got Abby Pulling, who's a reserve driver. So she's got the experience to maybe give some suggestions of what you should do and what you shouldn't do uh, to the likes of Sidakova, these younger drivers coming through. Um, but speaking of age, the second place as well, Sarah Moore, 27, not young, but finally gets herself a podium and for the history making elements of it it's amazing to see the first openly lgbtq plus driver and say openly because there's some speculation about another driver is made uh, into racing but on the podium though in a grand prix weekend huge news the sort of news that w series wants to be creating because it's a great news story and i thought after last year she seemed confident she seemed competent and more than enough to get into the top 12 to make it through to to 2021 but didn't ever seem to be somebody i think could be a championship contender when she in her own words in the post race press um session she said that she thought she overperformed potentially to get second place but she never looked like she was uncomfortable in second place jacob she just seemed serene following powell didn't really challenge for the victory, but didn't seem at any risk of losing second place. Yeah, and it's certainly a very much a step up from the 2019 campaign. It was almost if, if she was like sort of in her own league. Yeah, like you say, not quite good enough to uh, challenge Powell there for the win, but certainly looked no threat from behind. And, you know, it's going to be a, a long season, and hopefully we can see the consistency from her now. She's probably been working on a lot of things in the off-season, and we've had, a, well, as you say, a fairly, fairly long off-season between the last two seasons so yeah it was really good to see her and it's just great to see her on the podium as well a really just a really good really good story yeah great news story um some new things for this year floris teams structure not really a true team structure but a team structure uh and this is meant to transition into next year where they do fully have teams and it's meant to be for sponsorship opportunities which i do understand i feel like it muddied the water especially them introducing it so close to the first round and saying, oh, we've got teams, by the way, and these are the drivers, which seems to be some sort of potluck talent pool. What did you make of the driver team's newness with the, the way the drivers were selected and having a team structure in this championship? 
Well, for this year, uh, really, it, it doesn't make any sense uh, other than uh, they're just introducing them. Um, because I understand the like the, the, that it, that it's positive for for in terms of sponsoring, of course. Um, that is uh, very necessary. Um, uh, the drivers, most of them, don't even have that much money to race. You know, if they uh, if you uh, if they would have had to pay for W Series, they, you know, I, I think um, uh, most of them wouldn't even get in because they can't pay it. But on the other hand, um, uh, I know that there's like limited work on the cars in, in terms of uh, setup and stuff, and that will probably stay. So they can sometimes they can't even you know adjust a front wing or anything. So I don't I don't really see other than the sponsorship why why a team structure would would work in W Series honestly. Not a big fan then, Floris. How about you, Timo? I know you watched it before, and this time round, the liveries look great, and you can actually tell the drivers <laughs> apart, because that was a big, big problem in 2019, especially with the drivers switching chassis and then just having a bit of decal added to their cars. I could actually tell red cars, Garcia, and more. That's the sort of stuff I'll learn over the year, which is terrific. But team structure, what do you think? I, I agree it was a bit odd for it to be announced so soon also close rather to the race weekend uh, but I can kind of see why obviously from a sponsorship perspective it's good because again if you've got if you show you've got these things like these big brands and companies like Forbes and Puma on board then it's good to try and get more sponsorship uh, attention early for next year so you can build on that um, and some of the some of the teams and who's in which team kind of made sense like I know Martha Garcia's got a sponsorship deal already with Puma so that kind of made sense that she'd be there and Jimmy Chadwick's racing for Veloci and Extreme E, so you can see the connection there. But for others, you kind of like, they just kind of, it seems they just pulled straws for them. Um, I'm sure that wasn't the case, but I'm not clear on what that, what the what the determining factors were there yet. But I think it'll be interesting next year. I'm kind of trying to compare it a little bit to Formula 3 in a sense that it's good to have teams there. It's just another way to have a bit more competition. But I think it's, I think they're using this year a lot to, um, to test out these things and to see how they work a bit more. And then hopefully any kinks they'll know about well in advance of next year, because uh, Flores will send them an email amongst other things. <laughs> and then um, everything will be sorted for 2022. Compared to the F1 race, Jacob, a um, little transition into Formula One, wasn't the most entertaining of races in F1? No, I tweet about it straight off race. It was probably the worst race bar in Monaco. Just felt a bit flat really not a lot happened and we were waiting a week weren't we I, I think I put on a group chat and we were always talking about it it's on Twitter F1 even put an Instagram post about it we were expecting an absolute deluge be it Friday Saturday and Sunday and then in typical F1 fashion of course it stayed hot and sunny like a beach nothing really happened of note in the race there was a few overtakes from um, Leclerc and you can see my race report on GP Grandstand later that I thought he was a one-man highlight wheel although he did have contact with Gasly at the opening stages. Apart from that, yeah, Max was very comfortable and Mercedes have got a lot of work to do going into the uh, second round of Austria this weekend. Yeah, they do. Rain would be amazing to change it up this weekend. But actually, let's just wind back a little bit, Floris. You mentioned about the rust being on the drivers. Do you think we could have had a worse race in terms of um, how the perception of WCs would be if these drivers were forced to run in the rain. And it's a bit of a blessing in disguise that it was a dry race for the W series at least. Yeah, in, in uh, driving in the rain for them would be it would be chaos. It would be maybe fun for some people, but it would be, yeah, it would look terrible. So I think it was a blessing in disguise to have a, a dry race for sure. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure 100 percent on that because I know that some of the testing days in Anguissi they had a bit of rain, so they all have a little bit of experience there. So it might have been interesting to see how they'd cope with it if they've had already some experience with it. But we got a great race, so I'm not going to complain. <laughs> yeah, I actually, if, if you compare it to and to F1 this year uh, in F1, is maybe the first year in years that I actually hope for a dry race and and not a wet race. Because the racing is not not just because <laughs> uh, Verstappen is in the front, but because there's an actual fight between two teams. Yeah, uh, on, the, on the W Series side of things though, I did see some comments quite disparagingly dismissing it because of comparing lap times from um, Formula 3 and then W Series, people like LOL, women, all the sort of misogynistic stuff that we need to get rid of. And of course, they're not the same cars. You know, it's, it's a Formula 3 spec car, but the tires make such a huge difference. And I, 
I'm thankful because we did see some you know, rust, I think is the best word for it, Floris, um, like Hawkins hitting Chadwick early doors. That's the sort of stuff that I think in a few races time, we will see less of that. And Kimmy Linen's incident, yeah, it's different racing lines. That might be a bit of rust as well. But if you add some rain to that mix, that could have been, um, yeah, a lot of angry people. And yeah, I'm kind of glad that it didn't happen. I do want to actually just go through before we move on to Formula One and uh, give Flores his moment in the sun when he's leading the championship. But we've got a few, uh, I just wanted to bring up a few things that were brought up in the press conference, which I thought was <laughs> quite quite interesting. So I mentioned Abby Pulling um, earlier and I asked if Powell had seen that Pulling had got a podium from her reverse grid. Uh, I think it's eighth place to start for us. You're nodding in agreement. Thank you. So, and she had. Yeah, I'm not sure, but I think eight, yeah. But she had, and I thought it was great to see those two because we've got such a little AP duo going on. Um, so, a great weekend for, for both of those. I spoke with Moore, and she was talking about how next week she's not so sure whether it'd be beneficial for her to stay in the Red Bull ring. And this is something I'm actually quite curious to see because I don't. On a dry race, I don't know what the order will be. Will this be another race where it's the same drivers at the front, the same drivers at the back? And she thought, because she clearly is confident there, that it might be a bit of a chance that some of the drivers further back have got a bit more experienced track time, could maybe make their way up. But equally, she said she'd be somewhere in between. And Fabian Volvend uh, said that this was a better podium than last time. And last time she was hitting Alice Powell <laughs> of the first quarter, um, quite embarrassingly, I'd imagine, uh, when she sat next to her in the press conference. Um, but yeah, she that was a podium which never looked in doubt. This time from P9, absolutely vis visibly buzzing. Uh, great to see, bouncing around. And yeah, as Lichtensteiners go, I don't know any others so big round of applause there's not many there's, there's not many anyway and yeah just a, just a shame to see the swiss flag on the podium because of a is it a, a racing license issue floriston if you know this J, uh, you've got jacob there nodding yeah there. racing license indeed yeah yeah so we'll well if she wins we won't even know what the Liechtenstein national anthem sounds like but want to do a round of applause for the lesser spotted Liechtensteiner driver so formula one jacob you uh, started a little bit floris Let's give you a chance to boast about how right you were that Max Verstappen is going to dominate this season because he truly dominated the first round in Austria. Four wins in a row for Red Bull. What's going to stop them? Uh, you, you, you might be inclined to say nothing, uh, but it's still, it's, you know, it's still Mercedes they're, they're, uh, they're competing against. Against and they're not, uh, uh, they've not been champions seven years in a row for nothing. And I don't count them out. I don't, I don't even, I don't trust them. I think they're going to come up with something. <laughs> they're going to come up with something and it's not, it's absolutely not done. Um, but I do think it's, you know, it's, it's time for another champion. I don't even, you know, of course I'm Dutch. Of course I love that it's Max Verstappen, but you know, if it's someone else, it's okay too with me. Just someone else, not Mercedes, because they, uh, of course, they're concentrating on 2022. So this could be like, I don't hope so, but this could be the only year. And then we have another seven year domination. That's just so not Stop, do not put those <laughs> ideas in my head. That sounds awful. I'm delighted. I'm delighted there's a championship battle. I'm worried at the moment that the championship battle is going to turn into a Hamilton-esque domination with the Red Bulls just seemingly getting faster and faster and Timo Honda bringing uh, reliability upgrades which coincidentally make the cars faster are uh, Red Bull and Honda after being a GP2 engine onto an absolute winner this year Jacob said last time that he thinks it's the first time since the season started that they are the outright favorites do you agree I'd say so at the moment but it, I'd have to agree with Flores as well with that kind of if anything, makes Mercedes more dangerous because we, what you don't want to do is put a seven, like double seven-year champions into a corner and then just hope that they don't attack you. Uh, so I feel like if they're ever going to find, if any team's going to ever find a way to get back at Red Bull and at least make it difficult for them, even if they don't end up beating it, they're going to, it's going to be Mercedes. So I think at the moment, Red Bull definitely have everything better overall, definitely in terms of the drivers working together and being a, a solid team because Perez, I think I said last week, he's just really happy to be at a top team. 
he doesn't mind if he has to take the back seat slightly in some of it because he's again he's just enjoying and loving every minute of it whereas Botta still probably hasn't quite um given up maybe he should on um we're not like that but maybe like that on winning the championship um but obviously he doesn't have any uh, the results to back it up yet so I feel like once he maybe accepts that and knows that by supporting Lewis he's more likely to get a contract from Ilfa next year which is his only card to play really then maybe that'll be what Mercedes need to get them back in order otherwise mm, could be Red Bulls yeah it could be Red Bulls yeah I think uh, Jacob I thought long and hard about you what you said with that with it being the first time that we could imagine Red Bull being the favourites and I totally agree I hadn't really thought about it until you put it in my head and I think Red Bull do look consistently the better outfit every race this year that Mercedes have edged out it's been strategy wise not speed wise it's just Hamilton is not the lead drive this year and great to see and I'm just delighted that if Red Bull are going to be as fast as they are that you do have somebody like Hamilton as much as people you know love to hate him we've got somebody like Hamilton who was able to put up a fight and he doesn't seem to be the one that is going to quit Jacob no, oh, certainly in Hamilton, you know, never write Hamilton off and, you know, don't write Mercedes off as well. One thing that does worry me a little bit is we see time and again over the year, especially in the Ferrari car, after the summer break, Hamilton really comes into his own. And although I do feel that Mercedes are putting a lot of eggs into the 2022 basket, and I feel that's really important, it could mean that Red Bull, for example, on the back foot last year, like we saw Ferrari and McLaren after the 2008-2009 reset, so that could happen. But I do feel that Mercedes will have a sneaky few upgrades and they want to get to sort of Belgium and, and Monza and Zandvoort sort of area. But certainly don't write uh, Lewis Hamilton off. You know, he's not the, uh, he doesn't have seven championships in 90. Eight wins now to his name. Is it 90? 98? Wow. He certainly doesn't have 98 wins to his name for nothing. And Max has happened certainly in Lewis's head, but you know, don't count Lewis out, especially as I put in my report yesterday, as we go to Budapest, where he's um, mm. where he normally dominates in Silverstone. And I think the home crowd, with it being 140,000 fans there this season at Silverstone, I think that that might play into uh, the situation as well. Mercedes have several times said they'd welcome competition, Floris, and competition is here. And suspiciously, the team Red Bull, who do the quickest pit stops, are not allowed to do quick pit stops anymore. Your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think it's uh, absolute rubbish. You, you, you can just look at uh, all the pit stops Red Bull did uh, the previous years, and I think they made maybe the, the least mistakes of all. And uh, now you have Mercedes that made a mistake in uh, Monaco with the, the Bolt, I think, uh, with Bottas. Um, and now all of a sudden it's, it's, it's due to safety because it's, they say it's, the pit stops are too quick. It's not possible. It's just a, sort of an anticipation, anticipation thing. I really don't understand that, uh, but sure. I think, I think Red Bull uh, anyway will be quickest still after. Do we think, um, Timo, that Bottas was demonstrating how dangerous pit stops are as he made that sliding into McLaren's DM's effort in practice sessions, just to show that? Or is that just Bottas being Bottas? Bit of both, to be honest. Um, it, was, it was a bizarre incident, especially from a Mercedes. It's the kind of thing you'd expect down the other end of, of the pits, you know? Um, I was going to say, at least, I think I said in, in, in the chat on between us, I think that at least Grosjean had the DC to wait until he was out of the pit lane before he crashed in the Silverstone. So <laughs> Bottas just, just was urgent to do it. But I think it, it's, I think you do have that risk. But at the same time, I, I don't ultimately see the, the proposed changes making too much difference because at the same time, in theory, these drivers should be some of the best on the planet. So you shouldn't be having these kind of mistakes anyway. Um, you're going to have the occasional thing well, I don't think it's going to be a case of a fast pit stop causes something where I think it was it Stroll who hit one of the, the pit people in his own, um, yeah, his own team. Ever last year, um, I think. Yeah, I, I don't think a quick or a slow pit stop is going to be the ter- determinant of that. So um, it is a bit of a, a sus conspiracy theory-esque thing, but uh, I'm going to stay out of that one. <laughs> We've given Flores a chance to speak highly about Max Verstappen, Jacob. Now, why don't you wave the British flag for Lando Norris, king of consistency, third place in qualifying, 
thanks to Bottas uh, sliding down the order because of his spin and then getting a three-place grid penalty. But Norris really interrupting the start of the race and not allowing Perez to get past, which kind of influenced a little bit in terms of the victory because of the pit stop strategies with those drivers being so far behind, Bottas and Perez, by the time they did get past Norris. Another impressive display, in particular with Ricardo struggling again. Yeah, you know, I came into the season not worried for Norris because 2020 was a vast improvement on 2019, but he was going up against, you know, Daniel Ricciardo. You know, we've seen him over the years, Daniel Ricciardo's, you know, socking it to Max Verstappen on certain occasions as well. And, you know, being the last of the late breakers, I certainly thought that Daniel Ricciardo would be up there, but he's really not in tune with that car. And we saw that again this weekend, although he did have some issues. But going back to Norris, for me, he is my drive of the season. The absolute consistency we've seen there. He's nearly on 100 points already, two podium finishes. I've lost count of the amount of P, um, top fives. I think it's seven, it's seven and eight. I think. I think there was only one race where he wasn't in the uh, in the top five. But it could be a danger if he could sort of go on in the season in, in a sort of league of his own, not having the pace to keep up with you know Perez and Bottas will be ahead of him, but certainly enough to keep off you know Sainz, the pair, Ricardo, and, and the chasing pack. So it's fantastic, and yeah, I'm, I'm loving it to be honest. And as as a British fan, it, it almost gives us a refreshing element you know we're normally cheering on Hamilton but now there's another driver up there capable of podiums and I'd say potentially not to win I don't think he's going to win this season or come close to one because the car's just not up to it but certainly it's just adds another element to the weekend and it's great to see a British driver up there it's fantastic especially with the British crowd coming for Silverstone as well I think if he scores points this time around in Austria he'll have equaled the longest uh, point streak uh, that Fernando Alonso got for McLaren back in like 2007 so just to, as a comparison, I'll show how awesome he's doing this year. Yeah, the car, it's its a strange one. And Forrest, maybe you tell us off for being too patriotic on this. Uh, Norris seems to be driving that car yeah, exemplary, in particular when you've got Daniel Ricciardo, who is a known quantity, a very quick driver, race winner, how many podiums, even with a Renault really struggling to adapt and Perez has kind of seemed to have got on top of the car by now should we expect Daniel Ricciardo eight races in to be handling McLaren better than he is yeah absolutely uh like I think uh, at the beginning of the season or maybe before the season he said he needed five races like Alonso uh like like all the all the guys that changed teams and I think they all did except for him so I don't actually, I don't really know what the problem is. Maybe, you know, uh, the car is not tuned to him. He can't drive that kind of car. I don't know, but uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a bit worried because I do think uh, Norris is uh, really talented. He's maximizing it, but still Ricciardo should be on par with Norris, at least, I think. It's going to be a strange old season to see Daniel Ricciardo languishing and... I don't, even, I don't think even at this point, if Norris starts slipping down the order or the McLaren starts going down, or there's some parity that Ricardo is in any position at all to overtake him in the championship standings. And with both of them sitting on multi-year contracts there, that could have big implications for maybe next year if McLaren do jump up the order on who they're going to throw some weight behind because Lando is their junior driver who they want to champion. They've got this superstar in Ricardo who's going to bring in good sponsorship opportunities, but Maybe the success story for McLaren is to put all their backing behind Norris, homegrown hero for them. And that could be really dangerous for Ricardo. And everybody loves Ricardo. You know, it's who could not. But we can't really face the possibility this guy's never going to win a championship, as heartbreaking as that is. And yeah, Norris. I'm not ready to admit that yet. Still in denial, but yeah, Norris is really, really showing his worth and uh, great to see, great to see. George Russell, also another Brit Timo, showing his worth this weekend. How much heartbreak was there for you to see him retire the car with this hydraulics issue? It was pain, Jim, pain. It was just, I mean, eight, eight thousandths of a second off Q3 in qualifying in a Williams is just ridiculously brilliant from him. Um, and it's like, again, another reason why uh, Mercedes should really give him a bit more of attention for next year. And then, I mean, even with the issue, which we must assume he had as soon as the race started because of everything, he was still doing fairly consistently. He had, what, Ricardo and Sonoda behind him for a bit and neither one of them could really get past him. 
which when you think about it, the race pace on the long, because I mean, they knew, they knew from practice that the Williams was decent in the long run, but coming to the race is a different thing entirely. And you've got to think Yuki probably having a little bit of a sigh of relief that Russell had problems because it makes him look a little less uh, worse for wear. So, um, but Russell, what the hell does that guy have to do to catch a break at the moment? Just give him a point. We just want a point. <laughs> We're not asking for much. Just give him a point for for turning up. Yeah, he's uh, he's driving driving so well, especially with how poorly Latifi was very very not. I'm saying comparison. It's the the teammate disparity. The only other team like that at the moment you'd have to argue is unfortunately McLaren. So <laughs> it's a very very good point. Yeah, horrible to think about. Um, you mentioned Sonoda there, and finally we talked about. It extensively last week, Jacob, that he needs to sort his qualifying out. He did, and was fairly solid in Alpha Tauri, looking like a really quick outfit, showing some of that pre-season pace that we we thought they might actually be the, the third or fourth best team. Gasly is doing his bit. Sonoda, yeah, stepped up a bit this weekend. Yeah, Sonoda impressed me, and it was great to see him, you know, not bring out the red flags there in qualifying, although it would have been far easier to do it here at the Red Bull Ring than the miles of runoff there we have at France. And, P8 on the, uh, on the road, obviously he picked up that penalty for blocking Bottas and it's probably one of those rookie mistakes, but he, he made up for it in the race. But talking about um, Alfa Tauri, I said that Red Bull are, are the quickest and I'm going to say that Alfa Tauri, I think are the, the comfortably the fifth quickest, although the Constructors' Championship table wouldn't show that. I do think they have a slight edge there on Aston Martin. If you look back to um, the race, I think they've left a lot of points on the board and really through no fault of their own realistically. But yeah, certainly really good for a Really good for Alcatara and great to do it. Sort of, and not really a home race, but sort of a Red Bull family home race, if you like. Yeah, and with that sort of pace, they're nowhere near enough to be a McLaren-esque team to really put the cat amongst the pigeons early on. But do we think that when it comes to being lapped, potentially, I don't want to say any malice involved, but do we think that we could see Floris Red Bull using their four cars to their advantage throughout the season? I don't think AlphaTauri is uh, that strong, um, but I do uh, think that uh, Honda plays a big part in them being this strong. Mm. Um, and and Gasly is driving top. He's like uh, he's maybe he's one of my star drivers for this season. Uh, yeah, and Tsunoda just has to get up to speed. Uh, if he if he does, you know, maybe they can edge closer to like the McLarens and the Aston Martins of this world. But I don't. I'm not sure if they if they're gonna beat them. They're you know, uh, it's it's a long season, um, and just like in in the past with uh, Toro Rosso, uh, even when when Max was there, they had very good weekends and off weekends. And I think it's gonna be like that. They don't have a big budget, etc. So I, I hope because I, they're they're a very very likable team, but. I'm not sure. A yeah, long season to go. We'll see where the points finish at the end of it. Uh, Sonoda improving throughout the year could be key to them because Gasly, like you said, Jacob, is, uh, yeah, so he's been unfortunate with issues outside of his control. And who knows how far he could have finished today or this week if it wasn't for that Leclerc incident. Let me speak about Leclerc briefly. A um, lot of overtakes this entire race weekend. And no more than Charles Leclerc after pitting early Timo and making his way back through the order for, yeah, a deserved driver of the day. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone would be in agreement with that, aside from Pierre Gasly, of course, but I think Charles Leclerc is this kind of thing, it's like, oh, okay, you can overtake and you can do a lot of stuff here. Why is everyone else not really doing it or doing it in such quick consistency? It was, it was just, it was a bit like... Uh, Leclerc Jr. in Formula 3 last weekend in France, he was just stuck at the back and I was like, you know what, no, I don't really like it here, I'm going to just charge my way up through the pack and it was just, it was great to see because it was back, because you think of an oh no, not another weekend for Ferrari, they really couldn't could do with both cars doing well here um, and then they did and just the really well-deserved driver of the day, so thank God for Leclerc otherwise the Grand Prix would have <sighs> Christ, you know Sucks <laughs> Overtake, I think this really proved, especially back to back, that overtakes aren't the only thing you need in Formula One. You need that strategy, you need the element. They of, definitely help. It definitely helps, but you need that element of, I don't know how the race is going to end. And that's what, that's what for me, made France so excellent that it wasn't entirely clear until about three or four laps mm -hmm. before the end of what the finishing results were going to be. 
So yeah, a bit of a, a bit of a flat one, Styria. But we go next time out, and do we need rain, Floris, to make this a different race, or do we expect this to be more of the same? Uh, rain could be, uh, you know, could change it up. But um, I, I also, you know, the, the, they are bringing the softer tires, so that could bring like a, also a strategy element uh, with it. Uh, I think one compound softer. Um, the weather, of course, is a thing, and uh, you also have this. Also, the same with the W series. You have the uh, the data from the first weekend, which could change things. Like um, I think Ric Ricardo uh, maybe maybe or maybe not found his problem overnight uh, between the race and quality. So he'll probably do better. And uh, yeah, I think this the, the tires will will change it up. Yeah, fingers crossed. I yeah, I want to see. And the fans, especially, we're going to have packed grandstands next week as well. I want to see some Red Bull, Mercedes proper battling like we did see in France. And I want to see Norris not as much as you know, we love Norris here. I don't want to see seeing him there be best of the rest comfortably, have a bit of pressure. Maybe Gasly could have done that. Ricard, yeah, it, we just need, need something Austria. Jacob and I have staked our entire reputation on how good you are and you didn't deliver it's not, it's not going well so far is it you got outdone yeah, by paul good. ricard can you believe that it's it's awful how embarrassing <laughs> how embarrassing indeed now speaking of embarrassing shall we do the bottom three drivers first uh for w series so bottom three drivers of the weekend for you in w series jacob i have gone for my bottom three um hawkins and kimmelheim Kim Malinen for their um, for their uh, collision there towards the end, and I've gone for uh, Sabre Cook as well. I thought we'd see a little bit more from her in the race there, but she was just languishing towards the bottom in qualifying in the race. Yeah, the qualifying seemed to hurt her a lot. Um, yeah, and I'll I'll actually say mine because I can jump on the back of that. I do have Sabre Cook there. I need to emphasise that it wasn't entirely her fault. So she in the race this is that she she did struggle in qualifying undeniably, uh, but then she got tagged in the first corner. So had to go and pit, front wing and needed to be changed. Safety car seemed to help and then all manner of hell broke loose after the safety car when she pulled that gap up and she was, I think she's had a force off the road or had another incident where she um, just pushed a little bit wide. But it's like we said earlier on, if you want to be avoiding the incidents like Chadwick, you've got to be qualifying higher. So hopefully she'll have a better weekend coming up. And uh, I've got Vicky Piria as well for similar reasons in terms of qualifying lower. Uh, these drivers who are coming back into the, the sport, back in for second season. You expect them to do better than the rookies and they didn't in qualifying again. Of course, Piria didn't finish the race. Uh, and then the other one, bottom three, the stewards, because as much as I wanted to see Kim Alainen cause that bit of um, chaos in the race with that slow front wing, that was clearly going to fall off at some point. And that was dangerous. That was really dangerous. If that fell off in the middle of the braking zone on the downhill so it's lucky it came off where it did really so yeah and when you, even with the halo that could land in a really really terrible position so even in one piece or if it splits into several it's just a disaster one way or the other isn't it so yeah so really disappointed in the stewards actually I expect to see the meatball flag out there and it never came um timo bottom three for you uh saber cook just nowhere to be honest it was kind of she was on the bubble a bit in 2019, so it was kind of surprising maybe that she, maybe the year off last year was helpful in her coming back this year, but she just wasn't really anywhere. Um, and then Visser for me, just because we were expecting a bit more from it. Like qualifying was all right, but then I know there's a lot of craziness in the race, but she seems a driver that kind of relishes on that from what I've seen before. So it was kind of surprising to see her outside the points. And then I know it's her first race, but... Um, just from, from seeing a bit of her in doing another racing, I was kind of expecting a little bit more from Abby Eaton. So hopefully she can turn that around this weekend. Yeah, uh, a bit harsh, I think, with Visser there because of the incident with Kim Aline into Punter Dan, but she certainly wasn't leading the race or ever threatening to do it. So interesting ones. We'll so it never really got too far before then for me. No, I think for, she didn't. for a driver of her caliber. So. Do we want to have a compatriot uh, come and defend her honor with the <laughs> bottom three that you've got for us? <laughs> um, yeah, I, no, I have the same thing uh, that Timo has with Visser. I have the same thing with uh, Chadwick. Uh, I, I know it's a bit harsh, but you know, I wanted her to qualify a bit more. Uh, actually, I was expecting her to take pole, but I think Jim, you told me she had a little bit of a problem in, in qualifying. 
there was a crack, a car, some something was cracked in a pipe, some some carbon had broken, and so she was. I, I don't know how one. much how much that cost her, but I was uh, expecting her to take a clear like she had a uh, uh, Formula Regional uh, last year. Did a, she did extremely good stuff. She did a lot of racing, so I actually expected her to dominate, and she didn't. So maybe it's a bit harsh because she had trouble, but uh, yeah, well, I'm sure she'll do better next race. Um, like the other guys, uh, uh, Cook also, same reason. So uh, qualifying wasn't good. Um, and Kimelina, um, actually, because yeah, because she hit Visser and I don't want to be too hard on her because of the front wing, but I think it could she could have made the call maybe to come in. But I don't know uh, if she knew uh, how loose it was. So. Yeah. Obviously, the, the downforce was uh, removed. I was actually quite impressed with the pace that she did maintain with what clearly <laughs> wasn't going to stay on. She was really, actually, a few seconds off. But if uh, I was expecting some Nordic to be drivers, there. they just have a way about them. They know how to do this. Yeah, and I, I, I feel it's a, it's a funny one because I think if I was in that sort of situation, I can only relate to it in sim racing, that I'm just like, no, I'm going to stay out and try and get these positions. <laughs> uh, it's like you almost go, you know, the. the, the the red mist descends and it's like i am going to make up for this mistake and i'm going to score some points this championship's only eight races long oh yeah only in sim racing you can't kill anyone so <laughs> <laughs> very different um let's stick with you flores for your top three then uh top three of course uh paul just because you know uh, uh uh pole position race win and fastest lap i think so uh she had to travel um uh Belen garcia because she's uh She's, uh, she's a rookie, uh, and I think she was the highest finishing rookie. Yeah, I think she was the highest finishing rookie. She so uh, hands down to her. Uh, and of course, Sarah Moore, because uh, like you, I think I didn't really expect it. Uh, and like herself, because she didn't really expect it. Uh, last year, she didn't have, or 2019, I mean, she didn't have any standout performances, uh, two fifth places, I think. So this, this seemingly came out of nothing. So yeah, props to her. Absolutely. I think we can see some of these names repeated. Um, Jacob, you want to speak about your top three in W? Yeah, um, certainly a few names repeated here. I've gone for Powell. I mean, I'll be surprised if no one on this panel here chooses her today. Fantastic um, dominant victory there. I've gone for Moore as well, um, just because, you know, we weren't expecting, like Flores said, um, certainly not the best campaign in 2019. But yeah, it was just really nice to see a nice surprise up there as well. And quite boring, I'm, you know, going to... He's sitting on the fence here, but I've chosen uh, Volans as well. So nice to see her on podium as well. Just for, for different reasons to the other two, really, just because, you know, the fantastic comeback drive from a ninth to third. Yeah, I uh, have the exact same three, and yeah, I was a bit worried it'd be boring, but I think Koyama was the only other one who came up from so far back. Uh, all and Volvend also assisted by so many drivers falling off the track. But yeah, I, I couldn't look past the three the three podium finishes. So uh, they're my top three as well. And how about you, Timo? I'm going to do it a little bit differently because, I mean, we're all in agreement about Alice Powell, so I'm going to stick her on the list, of course. Because it was just, I mean, I think the one thing as well that you yeah, well, for fast in practice as well, not that she needed to be, but just an extra thing. was like, okay, we get it, you're dominant. Brilliant drive. Um, and then I think a couple of the rookies deserve, or oh, semi-rookie in one case, deserve a bit more props because you were dust from getting from all the way back at the back to 10th place. Some chaos maybe helped that, but you're still going to be there by the time the checkered flag goes down. So props to her. And then Cyril Cobra as well, just because the age and the speed and just managing to get it all, putting it together nicely, get some decent points on the board. So uh, they were a bit out, bit out of the box thinking that for me. Understandable. <laughs> Understandable, though, I think, with Redest, and actually you're going to correct because Redest got up to ninth place because Hawkins got, oh, nice. was it a 25-second penalty in the end, which I thought was pretty harsh. Pretty, uh, was it that? I didn't think it was that bad. Was it? Yeah, I think it's because they didn't do it in the race that they were considering a drive-through or uh, a 10-second penalty, but yeah, it was a pretty, pretty harsh No wonder you put the stewards on your list. <laughs> <laughs> the inconsistency of stewards, they're going to learn in, in the Formula 3 level racing. Now, Formula 1, um, top three, let's do it this way around first. Max Verstappen, if we saw Powell dominate, we've seen Verstappen dominate. He, the only thing he couldn't get, and that's for reasons outside of his control, was the fastest lap point. But easily looking like the best driver in Formula One right now, with the best team in Formula One right now. Charles Leclerc, I don't think we need to go into much detail about why. And then George Russell, for, for the obvious reasons. He's putting that Williams in places that Williams should not be. And 
I never expected, I don't think Alpine are doing particularly well, and Ocon really demonstrated how well or not well they're doing, but I never expected to see a Williams chasing down a, a two-time world champion, Fernando Alonso, during the race, and how great that was to see. And then they pitted it, and I'm thinking, yes, it's going to be an undercut, and then they mess around <laughs> with uh, these hydraulics, an absolute heartbreak. But yeah, I wanted to have a shout out to him. How about you, Jacob? Well, I've gone for Max, and I think we'll all be in agreement there as well. I've followed you with George Russell. Yeah, you know, fantastic drive to see him up there in P7. And just a shame that the car didn't play ball. And I was toying between Leclerc and Norris, but I'm going to put Norris on there for his consistency and the fact that obviously Leclerc is in the gas. That's the only reason I've not put Leclerc on there. So Norris is my third driver on the list. Yeah, it wasn't the cleanest weekend for Leclerc, was it, sadly? But he's uh, he made up for it and then some. Floris, your top three in F1? Yeah, of course, uh, of course, Verstappen, um, because I think he's the best driver right now in, in F1. Um, and like you said, of course, the best car, that helps. Um, Norris is the other one, uh, because he's just been driving uh, top all season. Uh, and he just, you know, he, he always qualifies so well. That's, that's very interesting. And, and Russell, yeah, he, he really surprised me with, I think he said after the race that he, he thought he could have finished seven, which is... Wow too crazy to hear like for a Williams uh, they didn't score a point last year then maybe one point the year before man that guy should actually I don't think he should go to Mercedes uh immediately but I don't know what other team he can go to he should go he should go to a midfield or a sub sub top you, you uh, want Williams to just dominate first. the regulation changes next year and then they can be really competitive <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Can see. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way yeah yeah they, seven so years that's my, of Williams uh, domination that's what he was predicting earlier <laughs> Well, he leaves and Latifi dominates the championship. Could you could you imagine the scenes? I don't think Latifi's going to be in your top three, Timo. Want to give it give us your not, not this week? No, you never know. Next week might be a different matter entirely. We can't we can't say for certain. Uh, Russell, for obvious reasons, just because he's driving the ass off that car. Um, Leclerc, because again, just brilliant drive through all the way. And I mean, I'll go left field again, just because I like seeing some fight in the old dog, Kimmy. It was just fun to see him being having a bit of a tussle about the place and enjoying himself because he seems a bit nowhere at times this season. So it's glad to see him at least putting a bit of a fight and just being a bit more classic Kimmy. So yeah, we all like a bit of that. Wasn't the best qualifying session for Kimmy, but yeah, made up for it in the yeah. race again. So yeah, it was uh, nice to see. I think everyone wants to see Kimmy do do pretty decently. My bottom three, um, I actually struggled a little bit more than I expected to, but Nicholas Latifi for previous anonymous reasons. Um, I put Sebastian Vettel in there and it might be a little bit harsh, but the Aston Martin isn't the best, but you got outperformed by Stroll comfortably all weekend. And mm. I don't think that's where Vettel needs to be or should be, uh, regardless of Stroll's longevity at the team. So yeah, Vettel, no points, a bit disappointing. And then pretty clear to me, Esteban Ocon, who is celebrating his contract renewal by doing absolutely nothing. And I don't know if he's resting on his laurels or the Alpine is slow, but if Fernando Alonso, who he was comfortably at performing before the contract renewal, is grabbing points and you're not, similar reasons to Vettel, you need to be looking at yourself in the mirror and bringing that car forwards. You seem to be nowhere all weekend. Flores, your bottom three of F1? Yeah, I, I think I have a controversial one because uh, you all had Leclerc in your top and I have him in the bottom. And that is because of uh, two reasons. Uh, the, the first reason is he uh, ruined Gasly's race and he almost ruined uh, Kimi's race by clipping his front wing. Mm. So he's, he was driving really scruffy in the first part of the, of the race. And in the second part, he, you know, he made that, that great comeback, but it was on the softer tire, like a, it was on a medium against hearts. Uh, so that isn't any, he, he overtook like an Aston Martin and, and uh, maybe Giovinazzi or something. So, uh, yeah, I think his race is a bit overrated. I, I think he looked scruffy and, and not that well. Um, the other one is uh, Ricciardo. Of course, we know, we know now why, because he has a problem with the, with the car. Uh, and like you said, Jim, uh, Ocon, I, I couldn't really think like, did he have a problem or did something else went wrong? But he just, I think he really had an off, off weekend. Another off weekend at that. Uh, Jacob, your bottom three? 
echoing everyone's sentiments there, I've gone with Ocon as well since his contract renewal is sending until 2023, I think it is. Yeah, Alonso just had the better of him, similar than France. He was really nowhere in the weekend. The TP for similar reasons, just anonymous and being absolutely outdriven by uh, Russell. And the third one I've gone for is the uh, weather radar. An absolute shambles. Three wet days. <laughs> 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 Yeah, it's one of these funny ones, isn't it, weather radar? Because I think it's like if it's going to rain at any point, they'll put a rain thing on. Um, but in the actual race where we want to see the race, yeah, uh, did you see the pictures on Saturday after W Series race? It was bucketing it down, but we know how Formula One can be with its magic weather repellent shield over it. Um, Timo, let's finish off with you crapping on some drivers. Sadly, just crapping on the usual ones that you've all been crapping on already. So it's Ocon, Latifi, and um, oh, Ricardo, which I know is a bit harsh because of the car, but it's again, it's it's just one of those things. I, I feel like before France, I crept on him a bit, and or I didn't crap on him. I crapped on him a little bit, I think, and it went all right then in the end. So if I crap on him again now, he might do better this weekend. I'm going to stop crapping now. That's uh, some sound logic, Timo. I'm sure. I'm sure he's listening to the podcast and just wants to show you that you're wrong. Um, yeah. One last thing: the Ocon has got the contract till 2024. I just checked, Jacob. So yeah, I don't know if there's some sort of level of comfort there or if it's just an a interesting of uh, development from today. I don't know if you'd have seen it as well, but uh, when you Joe's going to be making his F1 debut on free practice one on Friday for, for Alpine, so it's. Uh, Maybe that's just a little, we'll do that there and try and motivate Ocon just to make sure we can take the contract back. <laughs> Obviously not forgetting Callum Eilock, Stroud from there as well. Good mm. shout outs, talking F all, got the F2 drivers mentioned and the reserve driver, Paul Eilock, vice champion. Uh, but yeah, we've spoken F all somehow, spoke about F all for a long time, including a relatively lacklustre Formula One race. So until next time, where, Jacob, can people find your work on the internet? Obviously, you can find my uh, writing and there's a race report coming out today on GP Grandstand. You can find me on the podcast here every Monday. And you can also find me on Twitter at JPPhil18. Brilliant. And Timo? You can find me here on GP Grandstand, of course, over on Drive Tribe and on Instagram at t.elbiz.daily.drivetribe and on YouTube as well. Let's search the name. Floris, of course, we'll put your links in the show note below. But if you want to tell everybody where you can find your work, yeah, sure. Um, you can go to f one feedersericscom the website. Uh, you can go to my Twitter, at f one feedersericscom and the number one. Um, those are the two uh, main channels I use. Yeah. A little bit of Instagram as well. We'll put that in there for you as a courtesy. And for Thank me, you. you can find my work on gpgrandstand.com and fortlock.com where I write my F1 satire news search, the F1 week that was on YouTube. And of course, on the Grand Prix Grandstand TV YouTube channel, where you'll hear me interviewing drivers. We had one with Bruno Tomaselli, who's one of the newcomers this year. So you can find that there now and on the Talking F1 podcast. We'll be talking all about the Austrian Grand Prix, not the Styrian Grand Prix. You almost got that one wrong. Uh, we'll be talking F all about that in a week's time so keep your ears peeled for that next episode